In this video we cover how to pasteurize substrate and we also look at the five easiest methods. Hey and welcome to this video. I'll look into five of the easiest methods of cold water pasteurization. Now it's important, let's start off by looking at the difference between sterilization and pasteurization. That's a choice you've got to make. Lots of growers opt to sterilize their substrate and some growers opt to pasteurize their substrate. In short, the difference is that with sterilization you Try, you kill all microorganisms, whereas with pasteurization you opt to knock out most of those microorganisms. I'll link to a separate video here if you want to explore this further. Lots of growers who pasteurize the substrate use um, hot water or steam even. That's quite energy intensive. Here at the farm we prefer to use cold water sterilization, pasteurization rather, because it's just, it uses less energy, less equipment, and it can be fairly easy to do as well. So let's look at the five easiest ways to cold pasteurize your substrate. Okay, so we're gonna be talking about these five different methods, but I wanna start by just demonstrating one of those methods for you so you can see what it looks like. And we're gonna be looking at the cold water lime pasteurization technique. And this works basically by raising the pH of the water solution that you soak your substrate in. And when you have a high pH solution, it kills off most of the competing organisms on your substrate so that the following day when you drain it off, what you're left with is a clean substrate that you can then add your spawn to. This is one of my favorite methods. It's what we use on the farm here. It works really, really well. It's easy and it gives really good yields as well. So what you need for this method then are just a few simple bits of equipment. You need some kind of container for your water. And obviously you need to size this according to whatever scale you're working with. As Eric mentioned earlier, we use a large IBC for larger batches, but if you're doing this at home, you can use anything like a bucket or a food storage bin like we have here today. And um, you could use anything really from that scale upwards, like a bathtub or a larger container. To that, we're gonna be adding water and you don't wanna fill it right the way to the top because it will spill out. You wanna fill it 60% uh, full with water. Um, and of course, you're gonna want your substrate to soak in it. So what we have here is some chopped straw inside of a netted bag. And the type of substrate you use really depends on what you have available to you. We like to work a lot with straw and you can use any type of cereal straw for this. You can also use sugarcane bagasse. You can even use uh, sawdust or wood pellets. If you do use those, you just need to make sure when you drain them that enough water is pressed out that your, your substrate is not overhydrated. Uh, for more in information on substrates, check out our video. We've got a whole video on different types of substrates if you want more info on that. So aside from your substrate and your barrel filled with water, you're going to want the hydrated lime itself. Now, hydrated lime is calcium hydroxide. Um, it's often sold as builder's lime. And you want to make sure that it just is, has not got too much magnesium content, which most varieties don't have, but some that are made from dolomite, for example, have too much magnesium which will stunt the growth of your mushrooms and when I say too much magnesium we want less than five percent quantity of magnesium so have a good look for that just also make sure you don't use agricultural lime um, or garden lime that's a different type of lime you want hydrated lime we're also going to want a pH meter just to double check that the pH is up high enough once we've added the lime to the water and you'll see that I'm wearing gloves here and that's because hydrated lime can be irritating to the skin. So you wanna have a set of gloves on for that. And later on when I add that to the water, I'll also put a respirator on just so I'm not breathing in any of the particles. So when it comes to the quantity of hydrated lime you need to use, you need 0.2% of the quantity of water. So that works out to be two grams for every liter of water that you're using and then you just scale it up accordingly. So I'm gonna go on now and do the demonstration and we'll come back and talk about the next steps after that. So you should get a pH of between 11 and 13. And as you can see here, we've got high, on the high end of that 13, so we're ready to dunk our straw. Now 
and you'll find if it's straw that it will float so you're going to need a weight of some sort just to weigh it down and submerge it fully underwater. So once you've got your straw soaking in the lime water solution you're going to need to leave it in there for 16 to 20 hours. We normally do this in the afternoon and just drain it the following morning. Uh, that enables it enough time to pasteurize and to hydrate the straw at the same time. And you need to drain it for at least an hour then just to let all the water run off of the straw uh, so that it's not overhydrated. And in terms of discharging the wastewater solution that you're left with there, if you're connected to main sewage in most parts of the world, you can just discharge it straight into main sewage. Um, however, if you do want to neutralize it first, you can use something like pH down. It's just a liquid solution you add to the water that will bring the pH back down to neutral and discharge it then at that point. Once your straw has been draining for an hour or so, at that point you've got a nice clean substrate and you're ready to go ahead and inoculate. And by the way, I know that some people may have reservations about working with chemicals as part of their operation, but I think it's important to point out that um, you, know, you can neutralize the water before you discharge it, and that goes for some of the other methods Eric will mention. And likewise, both the lime bath method and the other methods that we'll discuss in a minute, these are all permitted under U USDA organic certification. So that showed you step by step how you can go about using the lime bath technique, but that's not the only option open to you when it comes to cold water pasteurization. You can also use ash, and ash works in a very similar way to um, lime in the sense that it raises the pH to such a level that most organisms simply die off. Ash also has an advantage, it leads to really beautiful fruiting bodies, but the disadvantage with ash is that you're limited in, typically limited in quantities. So if you want to grow on a larger scale, it can be really difficult to source enough ash to use at that scale. Right, then the next one is you can use soap, actually. Soap is a really friendly material to use, of course, so you might prefer to use this instead of ash or lime. The way this works is that it uses osmotic pressure to break down the cell walls in the microorganisms, so they basically rupture and then die off. The next option open to you is chlorine. You can use bleach or you can use um, swimming pool chlorine, and that kills off lots of um, all organisms basically and it gasses off as well so there's no risk to the actual pr product the actual mushrooms at the end so that's another option open to you and then the final method and I'm kind of excited about that because we've seen it in use in the online course community that we um, support but we haven't used it ourselves and that method is vinegar vinegar is the actual opposite of using wood ash or lime in that it creates a very low ph environment which is also not very friendly to microorganisms and they die off in that way so i'm excited to try that and that trial starts today here at the farm so the results of these tests with vinegar will obviously share with our online course community and the people in that community from today onwards will also find in detail lessons on the other methods that I just described. So I find this a fascinating subject matter and I'm not the only one. There's some really detailed studies out there that you can look up and let's have a look at one of them done by a friend. It's co-authored by a friend of ours, Dr. John Holliday in the States, who's an absolute pioneer when it comes to cold water pasteurization methods. Let's have a look at this report. I'll link to it below this video, but let's have a look at some of the conclusions of that report. So the first graph I wanted to look at from the study here with you is the, um, the one on your screen right now. And what you can see here is the treatment comparison in terms of um, steam pasteurization, lime, bleach and washing powder. And you can see there's a few things that you can take away from this graph. So on the left there's biological efficiency, which is a unit measure of your yield basically. And what you can see is that chopped straw which is in the green, has significantly better yields than unchopped, which is in the brown there on your screen. And then on average, lime treatment had better results than steam treatment. And you can see that the bleach and washing powder methods all had a slightly lower yield. So next up, let's look at some comparisons within the methods. Um, I'm going to look at lime and bleach with you. And what you can see on your screen now is that some strains work better with one method than others. So what you're seeing is AX and ELM, both are oyster mushrooms, and on the left there's still the biological efficiency, of course. And with bleach comparison, you can see the difference in yield is not big at all. In fact, it, it's similar at 120%. However, when you look on the right and you look at the lime comparison, there's a clear, clear difference. Um, the ELM oyster has got a way higher yield than the AX. So that proves that some strains work better with one method than others. So these are obviously the results of just one study and what I would take away from it is that it does actually impact the variety 
and the growing method does have an impact on your yields. And the best way to go about this is to just take this conclusion away and run your own trials, use different varieties and use different methods to see what works best in your situation. So if you enjoyed this and you want to learn more, check out our full workshop, which I'll link to below the video. Thanks a lot for watching and do subscribe to the channel.